Welcome to Savvy Business, Life Unscripted, with your host, Christina Rivera, where our guests share their wisdom and valuable business tips, empowering our audience to expand their personal potential. Hi, Kim Curtis. Welcome to Savvy Broadcasting, Life Unscripted. I'm so grateful to have you here today from the Wealth Legacy Institute. I love the name. You're the president and CEO, but you're going to talk today about how we can get more confident and build more confident confidence with money, especially how women can do that. Um, because a lot of times today I talk to people and we had a quick chat before the interview, how sometimes people get really funky about money. I had a good friend from high school and one day we had dinner together and I was having some money issues and I was sharing it with her. And I said, so have you ever had any of these issues? And she just jumps down my throat like, that's none of your business. Don't even ask me that. And I was like, what, what did I do? And so it's become like a, a taboo subject to even broach money sometimes and even talk about it. You know, it's really interesting when I think about that. And I love that story so much because our relationship with money is, is complicated. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, if you think about ancient Egypt, women and men were actually equal around money. And then if you think of what happened since then, particularly in the United States, you know, the last 300 years, we've been kind of written out and isolated. It wasn't until like the 1960s or early 70s that in some states, if a woman were to take a job, she would have to get her husband's permission. Mm -hmm. Or a credit card, they would only allow for 50% of her income, not the whole because they, until the Protection Act, I forget the name of the act, but that was in 1974. So we're just coming from behind uh, on so many levels, and particularly as women. And yet we have all this guilt and shame around it. So if we could understand that a lot of it's not really us, mm. it's cultural family baggage from, from centuries ago here in the U.S. anyway. So yeah. if you know that as a starting point, maybe it makes it a little easier. I bet. And and working with so many people and, and women in general, I, I'm sure you've come across the different, you know, feelings of guilt or or shame around money. I mean, that story with my friend, uh, we've been friend for like 32 years. So to have that response was really alarming. But why do you think so many people have that wrapped around money in particular? Because we do other, you know, mistakes in our life and we don't get that bent out of shape about making an error or a mistake around it. But for money, I don't know what it is about it. Well, well, I do think it's, it's some of the things that I already mentioned in terms mm -hmm. of we were not given the same rights and responsibilities. Mm -hmm. uh, we were raised to be seen, not heard. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think our parents really didn't talk about money necessarily. And yeah. so just right out of the gate, we weren't given some of the initial tools of having your family talk about money where you could feel empowered by it mm -hmm. versus thinking that your power play was spending yes. versus investing. You know, the handbag, the shoes, you know. You name it, that was the power play on spending, but yet not necessarily having the power play on you have enough resources to start a business. You have enough resources to start an investment. It was more the saving side yeah. versus the opportunistic side. So I think we were taught more that not about wealth mm. uh, or empowerment. It was more about safety and security and savings. You know, that's interesting. When you say uh, kids are to be seen, not heard, mm. that's one thing I got at a table at 22 years old. I was sitting there with all my cousins, my grandma, and my mom, and uh, someone asked me my opinion on something not related to money, and I gave my opinion. I was 21 years old, but my mom and grandma were sitting there, and my mom said, you know, shouldn't you be, you know, seen and not heard because this, you know, you're too young for this conversation. Maybe we were talking about sex or something. But I'm thinking too Would young. Have been better. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I'm 21 years old. When, when am I old enough to talk about that? So really, you're right. I, a lot of this is still permeating in our culture even today. Um, we're not given the empowerment part, but just the spend part. And I, I think it reaches probably across both sexes. Um, you see, you know, spending a lot more. How many times have we heard people win the lotto and go bankrupt? in fairly right. short time. And you think, well, how did that happen when you have millions? But hey, if you spend it quicker than you're getting it in, you're, you're gonna run out. Well, and learning about money is, is set points. Mm -hmm. So if you win the lottery, that's all new. You have no idea how to handle what that dollar amount is. So of course you're going to lose it. You don't know any better. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the things I always say is how you do money and how you do life. So if you put your head in the sand around money, you're gonna put your head in the sand around other aspects of your life whether it be, as I said earlier, that that shame, that fear, the insecurity around money, you're going to see that in other areas show up. 
And so when we think about what are the beliefs that we have around money, how do we take that cultural generational baggage and dismiss it and really Mm -hmm. kind of be free on how we show up and level up as it relates to money. And it's similar to, I don't know if you played sports growing up, but it's like repetitions and practice. Mm. And so really unpack what are those beliefs? Uh, What are your early money memories when you were a kid? Did your family talk about it? Your memory is like you got shot down, you know, on both with the, with the high school girlfriend and at the table. Mm -hmm. And so that those are kind of some things that slow you down a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so what, I'm, what I'm getting from you, Kim, really, it starts with getting clear where are your mindsets and beliefs? Because I don't think we even sit down long enough to figure out what are our thoughts mm-hmm. and beliefs surrounding money to begin with. Uh, like, say, my friend felt uncomfortable about that question, maybe for her going in, w- what made me uncomfortable about hearing that or, you know, someone asking me that question, where is that coming from? And I, I know for me, we had two different money dynamics going on with my dad being the I'm going to save for a big venture that will make us a lot of money really quick because he wanted to get rich quick thing going on. So he would do the saving thing to throw it into a big investment that really wasn't an investment and he'd lose it all. And my mom was the, well, let's spend for today because we don't know if we have tomorrow. So it was that kind of dual dynamic saving, but then splurging it all out for an investment. And the other one just, you know, we might not be here. Let's, let's, let's spend this puppy. Well, well, and those are two extremes. Isn't that interesting? So how do you find your center? So when I think about money dynamics, um, women are actually statistically better investors because they're more patient. So, you know, they're not trying to hit home runs. They're Mm -hmm. hitting singles to get on base to eventually score a home run, not a home run, but to to score a run. Um, So men generally are bigger risk takers. That that again gets back to societal normatives of things Mm -hmm. culturally that we're less likely to be risk takers. We're more likely to play it safe. We are not sure how far we can go. We're less likely to go after that promotion or negotiate the job. Mm -hmm. or to go for that big corporate job because we think we're not smart enough when we made me the smartest person in the room. Mm. But we choose not to take that risk because we don't trust ourselves. Mm. You know, that is really fascinating. I remember, Kim, and I I did a not so recent podcast on this, delving into the whole women not making enough and men making more. And my girlfriend and I, another girlfriend, were talking about the subject. And I had just read the a book called The Power of Yes, I believe. And the author had been broaching the topic that really men are are taught to negotiate, not just take the first deal on the table, but women, oh, I want to be nice. They offer me a nice deal. I should just take this deal. And I read it thinking, you know, how many times have I been offered uh, a job gig or something where they say, oh, this is what it pays. I'm like, oh, okay, that's what it pays. I'll take it. But never even considering like my guy friends I talked to say, well, no, that's just my starting point. When I hear that, my ears go, oh, that's where I get to start. And women mm-hmm. are like, oh, no, that's what I'm offered. Don't push it. Don't be, be nice. Don't, don't go, you know what I mean? So I thought that was interesting, that dynamic there. It could be one good reason why women don't grow as much, both investment-wise, but also money-wise. Yeah, I, I think it's really important to change the relationship around money mm-hmm. from being complicated in that relationship to being confident. Mm. So should we talk about what some of those things are besides unpacking the mindset beliefs? Yeah, I love that because w- what does confidence look like? How do you even begin to get confident with money? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we already talked about unpacking what's the story, kind of what are the values that existed in your family around money? And are you still carrying those values? And the nature of my work, we call it humanographics, but it's humanity on a graph where you plot out family structure. And then you ask questions about, tell me about your grandparents. Tell me about your great grandparents. If you know, what was their first job? When did they come to the U.S.? Uh, Different things. And then your children. And Mm -hmm. it's amazing what you find out. Oh, that's the first college educated. Oh, that's the black sheep. Those are So you ask bigger questions beyond the structure to Mm -hmm. learn about money and how money flowed through those generations. Because you could be showing up today being a tightwad and it was your great, great grandfather that was the tightwad that shows up today in you. Wow. So this is many generational thing. It doesn't just happen from like, you're just copying maybe your mom and dad. This can go way, way, way further back. Right. 
right? Wow. So if you understand that, it's a lot easier to throw off some of the shame or the guilt to know, yeah. okay, okay, this is who I'm going to be today. And what does that look like? And so when we think of all those things that we said, those three things that we said earlier about the cultural things that happen in the U.S., is that how then do we ask for more? So what are our goals and our dreams that are not financial goals of putting our th kids through college or someone else's goals, but what are your personal money goals? Mm. Because as women, we tend to go, well, we got to get the kids through college. Uh, mm. We, you know, oh, this, oh, I, oh, I got to take care of my mother yeah. or my father. And so think of how many times, and particularly the pandemic, women were really beat up and took the bigger hit mm -hmm. as it relates to staying at home with the homeschooling and the other types of uh, things that they had to step off or delay. Mm -hmm. And every time they step off or delay, there's like on average, women usually take about a year off. Mm -hmm. And think of that compounding effect of a year as it relates to how much you get paid and the amount in your retirement plan. So yeah. all these little things that we take care as caretakers of others, of the, at the expense of ourselves. And yet we live longer. Mm. Yeah. So, so that's another thing is, so what is the goal for you personally? What is your dream? And mm. then have discussions with your children as a mom, uh, have discussions with your spouse about what's important and sit at the table. Yeah. I mean, think about how many, in the nature of my work, men are into the investments can't wait mm -hmm. to talk about investments, but <laughs> women really don't care because the languaging is really is really not their language. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, you know they mm -hmm. that language is isolating to women. It's not a collective or a community, but women love to talk about financial planning because mm -hmm. it brings in the things that they care about. So mm -hmm. for us, you bring those together for the first time to talk at the table, where oftentimes we're the bridge and the safety net for having that conversation with your spouse. The first time ever yeah. of what's going on in your business, honey. Oh, it's a good year for you. Okay. Well, can we take a trip this year? And for mm -hmm. him to know, what do you really care about? Yeah. Yeah. He and may think he's doing a great job when he really doesn't know how to invest. It's been thrown on him. He pretends he does, but he really doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so to take that burden off the table for him and then have a joint financial plan, it's freeing. I, it is so empowering. It makes Game you changer. partners. It makes you partners. I, I love this because I remember uh, there's a gal who's um, a marriage counselor and she was mentioning how so many people come in and one of the bigger proponents of kind of tension in relationships is money. And she said sometimes both couples or the couple is operating on two different planes and they've never even talked together and they both feel like the other side doesn't get them. But from a non-judgmental, non-guilt, shame way to come together and say, okay, what's the deal? Let's just sit down and be partners in this. It's fabulous. You're, I could totally see it being game-changing. Game-changing uh, and, and um, peace of mind as that collective. What you just described is similar to sex. Like sometimes money is used in the same way as you withhold huh. money or sex, depending on which side of the table you're on in terms of the power play. Mm -hmm. So that's very interesting, which is why we bring that up in this conversation earlier, because yeah. it does get used for harm or for, for uh, power yeah. would be a better word, power. Yeah. Um, so when we think about that, okay, so let me just explain one thing to finish that conversation that I talked about with the, with the clients is, so investments are at the bottom. If you had a pyramid mm -hmm. and then you have financial planning up the pyramid, the next is peace of mind that I just mentioned. It's lifestyle. When you're living mm -hmm. your lifestyle, because money is kind of frenetic, all crazy. Mm -hmm. And if you bring it down here as your foundation, all of a sudden you have room to breathe. And once mm -hmm. you have room to breathe, that pinnacle of that pyramid is impact, like living your ideal life, doing the things that matter mm -hmm. to you, making a difference in the mm -hmm. world. And yeah. to get women to impact where they actually can think big and shine their light bright, yeah. we all know that there's something more here than what we're doing. Yeah. And yeah, to get that. them there, like we need to claim our power, mm -hmm. know that we're bigger than what we are, than what we think we are, and really know that there's more than the game you're currently playing. And mm -hmm. I think that would change a lot of conversations in a lot of boardrooms, at a lot of dinner tables, mm -hmm. and 
world conversations. Yeah. It, it would change people's lives and not only the lives of the couples, the married couples, if you're not married, but also the children involved, because how many That's children true. are living a miserable mm. family life based on these conversations not have being had? Uh, yeah. Man, so awesome. assemble the team, assemble your team. What does that look like? If you want that vision for yourself, bring your people together so that you can get smarter around money, have conversations with other women around money. And then I would say, start, mm. start. Just do one thing. And maybe it's like exercise. Maybe it's just starting with one thing. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Because I think some people will think, oh my God, I got to lose a hundred pounds. How am I going to do that? Well, let's just start with one thing. Let's just get rid of the soda or let's just right. stop pizza every day or something, whatever it might be. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. 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 Totally. I love that. And what do you think about bringing kids in, in the conversation? Oh, well, that gets back to what was your money story growing up? Did you get an allowance? No. Allowance should be for <laughs> activities, chores, not for you're a member of the family. And you could have conversations about this is for saving. This is for giving. Mm. And this is for having fun. You could do a third, a third, a third, or however you mm. want to do it in your family. But start early and start with chores that you get paid for work. Wow. I remember my mom saying when I was five years old, clean up the house and I'll I'll give you allowance. And so when I was done, I said, okay, can I have my allowance? 25 cents. And she's like, yeah, I put it into your college fund. <laughs> I, I, I didn't get to see it. <laughs> right. right. It doesn't exist. I didn't see it. So, so it, I, I'll say one more thing around this, Christina, is that we send, tend to say we need money. We need this. Mm. We, you know, but you know what? Money actually needs you. Mm. If women understood and men that money actually needs you to be anything, because all it is is energy. It's what we've created it to be mm. the value of exchange. So mm -hmm. if you think that money navigates our human existence, it's, it's a thread that holds us together. But what holds, holds it together is your ideas, your vision, your mm -hmm. values. That's mm -hmm. what attaches money to be able to do good and also the other side. But money needs you to do anything. Yeah. And if you look at it that it needs you yeah. instead of you needing it, then maybe that will change the way you view money. I like that. I like that because so much of it is it, how do I get more of it? How do I get more of it? Instead right. of realizing it, it's all in you because right. it, when you create value, all it is is you get paid for your value through the tool of money. So And, and the choice you make around it. It's yeah. all around the choice point. Yeah. But also we were talking earlier about even asking for, or, you know, when you have, go for a job or whatever. That's right. Oh, not having the hangups. Oh, you know, money, I shouldn't ask for that much. Why not? If you present the value and you give the value, you get paid for that value through the, the thing called money. It's not a bad thing. Yeah. You know, I have a friend uh, that shared this story with me and she wanted a million dollars in 10 years mm -hmm. to be able to retire and live comfortably. Mm -hmm. So after a few years, she had some money invested, but she wasn't really getting very far on her goal. And so she really kind of said, okay, if, if I did have a million, how would I imagine living that life? And what she wanted to do was relax and do the things that she enjoyed doing. So she started to do those things. Like, how do I take time for myself? And then what happened is when she started to do that, she kept having other obligations or interruptions take her from that point. Wow. And she really took a step back and was like, why am I allowing this to happen? And what she realized is oh my gosh, for me to be able to have any hope for this of relaxation and doing the things I love, I have to have more self-respect. Boundaries. Yes. And so she started to do that. And one of the things she really loved to do was to write. And so she, she got more and more time for writing because she had self-respect and boundaries. And she ultimately became a best-selling author and had more money than she ever could have dreamed of because she got better and better in her writing. Wow. And because she realized at that point that she needed self-respect, self-love, a choice point. And when she did that, all of a sudden, what she wanted from the very beginning was there for her. Wow. I think that's just a really wonderful under uh, example for women and others that you have to self-respect and self-love yourself yeah. to get to peace and joy. And when you have that, Boom. money follows because you're invisible to money when you need it. Yeah. Yeah. But it needs it, you. Yeah. You're, you're just changing and flipping the whole script because often we're yeah. putting ourselves at the mercy of needing it instead of realizing it, it's a tool. And here, what do I, because when you sit down and you get at the 
of the crux of it. Why do you want that million dollars? Why do you want to win the lotto? It's always that dream behind it. For your friend, it's writing the book. For someone else, it's selling the great seed, whatever it is. Just start moving towards that. You know, someone I know got a sailboat, went sailing, you know, on the weekends only. But the point is you're mm-hmm. starting to move towards that dream instead of waiting for money to show up. So then you can start doing those things. Yeah, I, I think that nails it. There's no amount of money that could create an extraordinary life. Yes. Absolutely. Wow. We could go on for hours, Kim. I loved our conversation. This is so deep. I'm hoping it'll get people revved up, start thinking about this going forward and taking some action based on what we talked about today. Where can people find out more about you, work with you? How can they do that? Yes. Uh, WealthLegacyInstitute.com and at Financial Literacy Press. There's a number of free resources there that you can download that could help on some of the conversations that we've had financialliteracypress.com, free resources. Wow. Well, I, I thank you so much for giving so much wisdom and, and insight today to our Savvy Auto. Thank you, Kim, for coming to Savvy Broadcasting. Thanks, Christina. Like, subscribe, and share this episode. To listen to more Savvy episodes and Savvy Biz Tips, go to www.lifeunscriptedradio.com. To find out about our paid sponsorship opportunities or how to become a guest, email Christina at lifeunscriptedradio.com.